again hey gang this is mr osborne i'm gonna do this just for sure this one time not necessarily for other chapters but maybe i will uh, we're just gonna do a quick little overview of the introduction to this course uh, i thought it would be good for you to see my face and um, to be able to go through this together with video, with my commentary. I have a few things I want to explain to you why this class is so important. So let's get right to it. Uh, most of the time in other chapters, you're just going to read through the PowerPoint, take your time, do that. And then there will be other videos that you can watch to help understand the subject matter. So um, in chapter 7, chapter 9, and chapter 13, we're going to do very minimal work in those. We, I almost wanted to skip them, but I want to make sure that you have some of the most important points. So I might do a short little video on those ones as well so you know exactly what I want you to know from that. But we're not going to invest a ton of time and a ton of effort into those. Okay, so let's get going on this. Uh, I wanted to introduce the subject of why building construction for firefighters is so important. In fact, I'm going to take my face away, if you don't mind. And hopefully now you're not seeing me. I'm not sure. Um, so... The objectives for this subject matter are in your instructions page, and that will be the case every single chapter. So start every chapter, click on the module for chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and then go first to the instructions page so you know what's expected of you for that particular chapter that um, I normally say week, but we're doing two chapters at least a week. So it's really hard in summer school. You really got to apply yourself and schedule yourself and, and get right to it. Don't get behind. You'll be sorry. Okay, so why study building construction? Well, first of all, because we need to know the battlefield. Um, when we uh, go to a fire in an unknown area with um, unknown factors, there's all sorts of safety issues that are going to be hitting us that um, in our own district, where we know the buildings, maybe we pre-planned them and things like that. We know the battlefield. We know what we're getting into. We know what uh, type of construction it is. What uh, is the roof quick to come down? Is the roof going to be rock solid and we can, you know, do a uh, aggressive job of cutting holes and things like that. So it's essential to have a working knowledge of the building's design, of its construction. Um, we need to be involved when it's being renovated, when it's being altered, when it's being torn down. Uh, the fire department is the only agency I know of, not even the building official, or health officials or anyone else that is involved in a building from the cradle to the grave. We play a part in the design, permitting, and allowing it to be built and monitor while it's being built. We are the only agency that goes in every year and monitors the building on an annual basis, inspecting it, then if it gets to the point where it needs to be torn down, of course, if it gets altered in between, we're involved. But if when it comes to tearing it down, we're involved in that. We have a, a permitting process and we monitor. Sometimes buildings are torn down from the top to the bottom. And as they tear it down, we have to assure that the fire department connections stay in place and in service. So we're involved from the beginning to the end. I always like to use this photo of Napoleon because he's a great example to us. Uh, he, he's a bad example as a leader, right? He was a dictator. He tried to conquer the world. Um, he tried to put everybody under his leadership. Bad, bad person, great general. 
Um, the reason why he won so many battles and was such a great uh, military tactician is um, a lot of people don't know this about him, but he was an insomniac. He barely ever slept. Uh, he, he was super driven. So when other people, when other generals were sleeping, he was up at night reading maps. And he had this um, enormous talent for picking the battlefield. The reason he won often was because the other guys would show up and they'd realize, oh my goodness, Napoleon already has his cannons in just the right place. His cavalry's hiding, hiding in the, the forest. His troops are on the high ground. He always picked the battlefield, except for Waterloo. Waterloo was not his choice and um and he lost so uh know the battlefield know what you're getting into well we're going to talk about how we do that i got to pick up the pace here so in the fire service it's really important to us that we understand construction language and that we have our own language uh in the fire service even from fire department to fire department we have different languages. There's a lot of traditions in the fire department. There's a reason why there's bugles on the chiefs and the captains. And it has to do with the old days when they used a megaphone. And that's what those bugles are there for. They signify a leader who would be telling everybody what to do over a megaphone. So um, an example, here's uh, an LA city truck. Don't call these fire engines. They're not fire engines. They're trucks. And don't call fire engines trucks because they're, they have water, hose, and ladders. But these are ladder trucks. Their main function is to bring tools and especially uh, the biggest ladder we got, uh, 100 plus feet um, of ladder to the fire. Well, this is in LA City in the middle, top middle. Uh, the middle right is a FDNY, and on the bottom is an LA County truck. Well, they have their own variations and differences, but if you knew, know much about these fire departments, well, these all three of these fire departments refer to the driver of these trucks as something different. If you work for LA City Fire Department, the man or woman that drives that truck is called an apparatus operator. They get paid differently and they have a different test than an engineer. An engineer drives a fire engine. An apparatus operator drives a truck if you work for LA City. They're one of the only ones I know that use that. Well, I had a whole bunch of friends who went to FDNY after 9-11 and got to know a lot of the firefighters. And one of the guys came back and told me, he said, I was at lineup with them and and the captain says, who's the chauffeur today <laughs> with that New York accent? And and he's like thinking, chauffeur? What, what are, the guy that drives the chief around? What, what are they talking about, chauffeur? Well, a different person drives the engine and the truck every day, and it's a firefighter, and they call him the chauffeur. So, I, you know, I never heard of that. At least that's the way the story was told to me. Uh, and then if you work for L.A. County Fire Department, well, they don't have a designation between an apparatus operator and engineer. They have the position called firefighter specialist. And a firefighter specialist is the rank that I was. Um, and most people would just call him an engineer. But when you're a firefighter specialist, you can drive an engine, you can drive a truck, you can be a camp foreman, you can be a fire inspector, you can be a fire investigator. All of these roles were filled by the firefighter specialist. So you got to know the terminology of the fire department that you're working for. And when we're dealing with buildings, we need to know the terminology of the construction equipment. So we need to use the terms of the construction trade. So, uh, clear communication. Um, your book gives these couple of examples of the Avianca airliner that crashed on Long Island in New York. 
due to miscommunication, people didn't get there correctly. Um, and you can read about that in your book. Uh, and they also give the example of one building collapse where the commander yelled out, pull your line out. And it was totally misunderstood. So what we want to make sure in the fire service is we use the right terminology. Mayday is the universal distress signal. If, if we have firefighters trapped, if we need to get people out immediately, we need to use the terminology mayday. Many fire departments also use, um, let's go to this next one, use the, uh, the engine, uh, air horns and they'll hit the air horns three times that's the way LA County does it they hit the air horn three times big long loud blast and sometimes really hard to hear inside a building with fire roaring with a radio chatter so this is one of the ways where they're hoping that everybody uh, can hear by a long loud blast three times in a row uh, and it means get out don't use terms like withdraw in good order well that's a great military term if we're going to retreat we want to do it in an orderly manner where some are protecting and uh, still in the firefight while others are backing off um, that's great um, even the term going defensive that's that's great uh, and can be used by many. We're going to go defensive, but not everybody uses that terminology. So again, we call for May Day. Um, and it's, so when we're going into a fire and we start using construction terms, we need to know what's being said when we say this is a lightweight roof and uh, trusses are beginning to fail. Um, a lightweight roof under direct fire can't even last five minutes. Uh, it takes the average fire crew five minutes to get to a fire. So if the fire's really going good before somebody calls in, by the time we get there, it's very risky to get on a lightweight roof or a truss built roof. So we need to know this construction terminology. We'll talk about some more examples in a minute. So um, one of the things that we do to make sure we're ready and we're we're understanding what we're getting into is we do pre-fire planning and we analyze buildings so we should know the buildings especially in our district and and in our community um your battalion we should say so brannigan the our author of our book back in 1948 um he was the original author of this book and it's been edited and changed and updated by other authors continuing to use his concepts and his original writings. So he wrote an article, Surveys Aid in Preparation for Handling Large Fires, all the way back in 1948. And uh, he believed the more firefighters knew about the buildings they fought fire in, the safer they would be and the better they could prepare for uh, what might be happening next. So um, did you know that FDNY was one of the only fire departments that didn't use ICS? And that's why their chief died in the fire when the buildings collapsed. Um, but uh, they, they, they give an example in the book about an FDNY firefighter. Uh, no, it wasn't in the book. It was in an article I read that had worked in a building as a facilities manager became be, before he became a firefighter. Well, they ended up going on a fire at the building where he was the, the manager. So um, he... He heard the, the, the incident commander give the order, hey, somebody needs to turn off the utilities. And he got on the radio and said, hey, 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 you got to turn off the code generation plant before you turn off the power. Because he knew that if the code gen plant was still on, it would auto reset and the power would come back on even though they'd turned it off. So he had that inside knowledge. Well, that's what we want to do whenever we do a pre-fire plan. So the more we can understand the buildings by knowing the signs of the types of construction, but also pre-planning by going and visiting them. So what we do, it's a key component of a lot of fire departments. 
the, the crews will go ahead of time and will do a pre-incident plan. The NFPA defines a pre-incident plan as a document or nowadays a, a, uh, a digital document developed by gathering general and detailed data that is used by responding personnel in effectively managing emergencies for the protection of occupants, responding personnel, property, and the environment. So nowadays, most of the, they, when I first got on, they were all on paper. We had a big binder in or a folder in the fire engine that had our target hazards, the worst buildings, the worst occupancies that concerned us, hazardous or, or hospitals or places that had a lot of people in it, hotels. They, they might be our target hazards. Hopefully in our own district, we'd been in every business building, not residences, but business buildings. And um, so nowadays we use GIS and GPS um, but we're going to put together something that'll come up on the tablet or the mobile data terminal. Um, so as I said, the old school was paper forms. They were drawn, um, but then they started getting into, like this example here that you see on the right is the Ronald Reagan Library in uh, Ventura County. And um, it's a great example of a pre-plan with additional information this is just one page out of it where it shows where all the hydrants are where it shows where the fire department connections are but it also will give information about the kind of building uh, the type of construction they're useful tools so um, they use autocad to make this one it's a professionally digitally drawn image um, or someday at times some fire departments still use the old school uh, paper forms drawn uh, but most of the time you're going to see these digital um, types of images. So um, in a pre-fire analysis, we want to accumulate as much information as we can. And, uh, you know, when you're conducting a pre-fire plan, as a crew goes out, we want to look at the building. We want to look at what's made. What do we recognize as we're standing outside? And then when we go inside, is it the same as what we thought? I'm gonna give you an example in a couple of slides of how we can be easily deceived if we haven't really gone inside. Uh, you know, you always assume that the biggest beams are going across the um, narrow part of the building because it's a money saver. But sometimes you'll go in and they're running the length, not the width. So it, this is why you want to go in and pre-plan buildings. Now, a pre-plan is not the same thing as an inspection. M make sure you remember that. And um, we always want to make an appointment with the business owner. And they, they usually see the value in this, that it's us trying to do a better job of protecting their building. So they usually cooperate. Um, but remember, this is one of the things I teach uh, fire prevention a lot because I spend a lot of time in fire prevention. Um, and in, this is one of my Osborneisms. Uh, an inspection is not a pre-plan, but when we're doing an inspection, we always pay attention to the building and we might talk about what it's made out of. So we want to become more aware. Visualizing the building is always good. Um, but a pre-plan, on the other hand, is also not an inspection, but if you're doing a pre-plan and you see a safety issue, well, you're going to point it out. You're not just going to ignore it. So an inspection is not a pre-plan. A pre-plan is not an inspection, but we do a little bit of both whenever we are visiting any building. But a pre-plan, we're there to learn about the building, how to better be prepared to fight a fire or deal with any emergency there. So, uh, you know, usually we're going to have the highest ranking firefighter is going to do the main portion of it, the captain, or if we bring a chief, usually it's a captain, and they're going to uh, maybe assign a couple of the firefighters to write things down with them. Um, and, you know, they're not always going to understand who's who. Uh, that's why usually the captain will be the one to introduce themselves, say, hey, I'm Captain so-and-so, I've got my crew with me. Sometimes we do pre-plans, we bring the whole first responding company. But uh, that's not always. You don't want to um, 
impose on them. You you want to, them to see this as a benefit, just like it is for us, that it's a benefit for them. If you allow the whole crew in, sometimes it can be a distraction. Sometimes it can be really beneficial. I, th I think it's best to bring the whole crew, but they need to be you know, responsible. And hey, if they wear hard hats, we need to wear a hard hat. If they wear eye uh, uh, protection, we need to wear eye protection. Um, whatever their safety rules are, we need to follow that while we're in their facility. Um, sometimes it'll just be our, our uh, captain or a main officer that'll do it, and then we'll bring the, the rest of the crew later. But uh, it's best to be there together so everybody visualizes it. Now, while we're there, we're going to also look for fire code uh, violations, but that's not our main purpose. But what we might find is that the building is not compliant in the sense of changes have been made. So the top right picture is a great example of that. I hope you can see this and that you've made it full screen on your uh, computer while you're watching this. Do you see that's a come along? Somebody has bolted a come along to one side of a building and to another side and used it to pull the roof together because it was starting to fall apart. So this is bad news. And if we see something like that, we're going to say something. We're going to let the building official know. Um, so we need to kind of know the basic building and fire codes. But we're also there um, because we're looking for unexpected things, looking out for deceptive buildings. This bottom picture is an example of a pre-1933 type 3 building. So let's Let's see why that's so significant. So expect the unexpected. The greater our understanding of the building types and methods of construction, the safer we're going to be. You look at a building like this, and we call this building that it's it's got a lot of makeup on it. The front of the building's got lipstick and mascara and a brand new haircut, and it looks really modern and new in the front. It's got stucco. Um, it, it does give us that little bit of ornate look on top, does kind of give me the idea this is an older building, but not necessarily. However, this building is an example to us of pre-1933 unreinforced masonry. They're considered type three, which is usually pretty, uh, pretty substantially built. Um, because all of the walls are some type of masonry, but this kind is unreinforced masonry. Um, the way they were built, they were subject to collapse, and the reason why we call them pre-33, in 1933, there was a big uh, quake that originated out of Long Beach, and it brought down buildings all over L.A. County and some of Orange County, and these buildings were built without any steel reinforcement, um, they were mostly brick, and they a lot of them collapsed. So after that, they reinforced them in different ways and tried to make them safer. But you look at this building from the front, and you wouldn't jump to the conclusion that it's pre-33. So let's go to the back. Uh-oh. We start seeing the signs and symbols uh, the, the little things that are going to say, uh-oh, we got a 1933, uh, pre-1933 building. So when you look at the sides in the back, you see a different story. Telltale signs of a pre-33 building is they have exterior utilities. See that top uh, middle picture, uh, the white building? It's got uh, utilities that you cannot tell uh, from the front that this was a pre-33 building. But when you come back here, you see the brick. You see also both on the doorway in the white building and the window in the green building that when they did brick, they would kind of make these ornate looking window, uh, the top portion of, of, of the window. Do you call that a lintel? I forget. Um, but it's it's got that uh, more ornate looking windows well that's another telltale sign the arches or something very ornate about the doors and windows these are all telltale signs uh also we'll see uh in the next slide close up the way the bricks were put together 
So um, another telltale sign is if you look here, uh, every seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then they're on end. It's kind of hard to tell there. See how this row is on end? instead of a course that's going sideways they're going front to back well that's called a king's row and a king's row tells you this is a pre-33 building because what they did is they put two sets of bricks side by side and to make it stronger but if they kept going up straight it would just fall over eventually by every seven uh courses they put them on in to tie the two together and to give it more strength. But there's no steel in here. And as you can see, uh, also the kind of mortar that they used was not the same as what we use today. So it, you, you can take your finger and scratch this mortar and it'll come out. So this is a great example to us of a building. Look at here, concrete block. And you think, oh, this is really safe. This one, they even added concrete block up on top. And you could look at it and be deceived by it. Another telltale sign is these tie plates. Well, what are they, they doing there? They're holding the top of the building together. Because so many of them collapsed, they retrofitted them with these big, long tie rods with turnbuckles in the middle. And they put the tie plates on the ends. Then they turn the turnbuckles in the middle of the building and pull the walls back together just like that person tried to do with the come along but this was a an officially done with building uh, officials um, endorsement and they pulled the walls together okay i got to finish this up here um, i just wanted you to give an give you an example of how we can be easily deceived if we just glance at a building and don't look at all the sides this is why a good captain uh wants the engineer to give them three sides of the building when they pull up on a fire. Uh, the first side, the front, and the second side. Um, and then they'll have somebody go look in the back for them. You want to see what kind of a building it is. So um, another way, other than our pre-fire analysis and visiting buildings, we want to pay attention to data that's being collected by agencies like Firefighter Close Calls and the NFPA. So we get after action reports and we find out about certain, maybe the green construction's new and we're finding new things about green construction. So um, and they got batteries in them. They've got uh, more solar panels. How do we deal with all of these kind of things? So we we learn about it from data from other fire, fire, firefighters where you know they've tried to cut a hole and they couldn't because of so many solar panels. Uh, and what do we do about that? Or they go into rooms that are full of battery banks and, and they're on fire. Do we just throw water in there? Well, we might be sorry if we did. So a knowledge plus training plus experience plus intuition and common sense are going to equal safe and effective firefighting tactics. So we go out there, we do the pre-plans, we study about fires, we learn from experience. And uh, so why do we do what we do? Well, part of it is our traditions um, and our our tragedies and our triumphs. We learn from them, um, but we got to realize there's a lot of issues in real world firefighting and learn from the heroism and the bravery of others. And when people have died in fires, we need to learn from it, not uh, criticize them Monday morning quarterback, but learn from it. A lot of times we make mistakes that one little mistake leads to the next one, leads to the next one, leads to the next one, because we're trying to get our job done. We get so focused, we get that tunnel vision, and we don't recognize the hazards. So we want to be better at recognizing the hazards, recognizing the building type and our surroundings, and help every firefighter do their best to abate the problem safely. So there's a couple of uh, summary slides here. Um, if you want to turn it off right now, you can. Let me just say, understanding building construction will ensure the safety of every firefighter on the scene. If you understand where the weaknesses in a building are, you can make sure that you and your team avoid these areas. For firefighters, using proper building construction terminology is essential. We've got to communicate in a way that everybody understands. 
when we pre-plan, we get more knowledge about the buildings. It's important fire department function that enables firefighters to minimize surprises. We don't like surprises on the fire ground. Uh, there's a video I'm going to include um, uh, in the video section of this module where a Fresno firefighter was using a sounding tool um, but he was getting closer to his objective. His last couple of sounds look a little soft and he took a step and fell through a garage into the fire. Um, it's a really hard video to watch. When I saw it the first time, I thought no way did he survive, but you can find videos uh, on YouTube that show that he did survive and show him going home to his family. Um, so it's, it's good news that he survived and wasn't burned as bad as you would think. But um, nobody wants to get surprised falling through a building. I had a friend that did it and he survived also, but his hands were badly burned and uh, it was quite a traumatic event. So uh, pre-fire analysis, pre-planning, it all helps us to identify the specific construction issues or concerns uh, so that we can be prepared. Um, Many, if not most, buildings are not always compliant with all the building codes. So when we do this, just like when we go on inspections, we might find some dangerous conditions before an emergency occurs. Uh, one last thing, you know, you want to rip, study uh, past fires and from the lessons learned from um, fire disasters, fires where things went wrong. I teach wildland firefighting. That's especially important there. Learn from the mistakes of others. It's so easy to get tunnel vision. Our, our safety is our number one priority. If we're all out of business by being injured, who's going to save the building? Who's going to save the people? So we want to consider the risk before we go in. Hey, thanks for listening, and I hope you have a great day. So I, I meant for this to be shorter, but I, I just get going and talk too much. <laughs> Sorry. Bye.